ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, on behalf of the family and on behalf of the Stickley Goodrum Funeral Home, I'd like to welcome everyone here joining us today, either in person or at home via the live stream. Just before we get started, I just have a couple announcements to be made. Firstly, if anyone here has a cell phone, I just kindly ask that you place it on silent mode or just place it off just so that we don't have any kind of interruptions during the service. And immediately following the service today, the family has graciously arranged for a time of fellowship and reception downstairs in the lower lounge. So immediately following the service or assess down the center aisle, make your way downstairs and sh share some more memories and stories that we have. If anyone needs to use the elevator, just ask one of our staff and we'd be happy to assist. I'll now pass the service on to Reverend Phil Dalmore and we'll begin. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. As Daniel said, my name is Reverend Phil Dalmore. I'm the minister at Northwest Barry United Church, which is Bob and Sharon's home congregation. And I've had the pleasure of being their minister for the past many years. And I'd like to begin by saying how much I loved and appreciated Bob and how much I'm going to miss him, as we all will. We're all here because Bob meant something special to each of us. Whether we knew him from church or from Tollendale, from the community, or the many other groups and organizations he was a part of, we all bring our stories and our memories of what Bob or who Bob meant to us. But to some of us today, Bob was much closer than that. He was part of a very close and loving family. And I know he's being honored today, most especially in that role. The circle of family is indeed the closest circle that we have. It's where we have our strongest bonds, our greatest support, and our most lasting memories. For everyone today who lost Bob as a family member, we certainly acknowledge just how deeply that loss is being felt. Today we're going to honor Bob's life through the sharing of some of those memories and those stories from those who knew him so well. And in their memories, I know we will find our own. Today we're also going to share some of the faith story that was a part of Bob's life through the sharing of uh, readings and through prayers and hymns. So to begin, I'd like to invite Lauren to come forward, and she's going to share the first reading with you. Ecclesiastes 3. For everything there is a season, and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to harvest what is planted. A time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, and a time to lose. A time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to tear, and a time to mend. A time to keep silent, and a time to speak. God has made everything suitable for its time. Amen. Thanks, Lauren. You know, as sad as today is, it also really is a celebration of life and a celebration of Bob's life. And I know that's how the family wants to, uh, would like the tone of this service to be a real celebration of who Bob was. So what better way to do that than through sharing a, a celebratory hymn, and uh, it's called Joyful, Joyful. And uh, if you know it, please sing out. But I invite you to stand and let us sing this hymn together. Thou art born. 
Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals, join the happy chorus which the morning star Please be seated. And let us now come together in prayer and let us pray. God, may your presence be felt as we gather in this place today to honor and to remember the life of Bob. We are today one extended family, all drawn together by our love for Bob and our appreciation for the gift of his life. And so as family, may we care for each other. May the warmth and support and kindness that we feel here today be freely offered, creating a spirit of healing and peace. May the words of faith that are shared today give us hope that there is more to life than we know, and that in the mystery of what is beyond this life, we need not fear, for there is only peace, there is only love. And in the stories and memories that are shared of Bob, in both the laughter and the tears, may there be only gratitude for the gift that was his life and for all the good things about him that will remain as a lasting testament to his life. Bless and keep us all as we share, listen, sing, and pray together. Amen. Our first uh, set of tributes will be from Kevin and Sean and Owen. I'd like to begin by inviting Kevin to please come forward. <clears throat> first of all, I I want to extend a big thank you for everyone uh, for coming today. Uh, I have to admit, when you know they asked us, how many people do you think would show up? We, <laughs> we had no idea. And uh, I, I know my dad would be probably surprised, probably overwhelmed. Um, but we, all of us, we really appreciate it. It's been very helpful, especially to my mom. Um, and so for that, thank you. And for those that, uh, I'm not sure where the camera is, but I know we're being streamed. So thank you. <laughs> uh, lastly, for those of you that uh, did come up uh, to the front uh, and ask the question, which one of you is the oldest? I thank you for that. <laughs> it was a shocker uh, to learn the news of, of Dad's passing. But... You know, with, with each passing day, uh, it, after a little bit of time and reflection, we, we soon realize that, you know what? My dad died a happy man. In uh, the days before or the, the months before, we'd uh, gotten together for a couple of big extended family get-togethers over the holidays, Christmas, which dad loved. Uh, later on in uh, February, we celebrated... Uh, Big milestone birthday for, uh, for mom. And uh, in the two weeks prior to dad passing, uh, mom had actually been traveling with friends in, in, in Egypt. And while that you know, was a bit of a tough pill for her to swallow, um, what that actually meant for the rest of us was that we were in uh, much more frequent contact with dad. Somebody called him, spoke with him, or FaceTimed him, or saw him uh, every day during those two weeks. And that may not otherwise uh, have happened. So 
Uh, it was a, a, a bit of a blessing in disguise. And I can tell you that when we did talk, his agenda was full. I met a few people here this morning um, from his coffee club, as it came to be known, also known as going to the office. <laughs> Every morning at 10 a.m., I think it started originally at a, a Tim Hortons and McDonald's, and then I think with COVID graduated to uh, Tollendale Village. And as Dad would say, we, we get together at 10 uh, and solve all the world's problems. <laughs> During those uh, couple of weeks, whether it was meeting for coffee, meeting with friends, um, I tried to, uh, Bianca and I tried to get him out for a dinner, and he, his agenda was full. He was, he was too busy, but he was busy seeing friends and doing the things uh, that he enjoyed. Uh, he even met up with a former co-worker from Hill Refrigeration. Dad hadn't worked at Hill Refrigeration since the mid to late uh, 1980s, that was, but it was pretty special for him. Uh, the last time I spoke with Dad was the day before I passed away. And we were joking, Dad, you, you better get the house cleaned up. Mom's going to be home in two days. And he said, you know what? He said, I've got one more thing I want to do before Mom gets home. I had no idea what that would be, but I had to ask, well, what is it, Dad? I want to go out for liver and onions. You're raising the bar pretty high there, Dad, but okay. <laughs> and he, I'm happy to say he did. Um, we had to, sorry, uh, we were afforded the opportunity when we were kids to enjoy liver and onions. <laughs> it never quite took. But uh, we always had to eat them because, as Dad would say, we're not running a restaurant here. Leave it to my dad to find, in the city of Erie, a restaurant that would not only serve liver and onions, but actually charge you for it. <laughs> there was one other thing that, um, that Dad had to do um, that none of us knew about. We, we only found out afterwards. It turns out that every time, not that it happened that often, but if Mom were to go on a trip and Dad wasn't there, um, Mom would come home and Dad would be greeting her with a f uh, fresh bouquet of flowers. And that was true. Uh, right, right up the end, Mom came home from, from her trip, and there were a, a dozen uh, red roses in the vase on the table waiting for her uh, upon her return. Speaking of flowers, I um, want to mention the blue and pink carnations at the front. Now, it was done on purpose. It's a tradition that started uh, shortly after I was born, uh, over 40 years ago. <laughs> I said over 40. <laughs> um, Dad started with a single blue uh, carnation, and then uh, this was for Mother's Day, and then the next year the same thing, and then eventually my brother Sean came along, and a second blue carnation was added, then a third, and then daughter-in-laws, grandsons, granddaughters, and that's the representation you see at the front with the nine uh, carnations, something my dad did um, right up until he died. He was, uh, <clears throat> he could be a very sentimental man. He loved my mom dearly. They were together 65 years. They dated for five years, and they were just getting prepared to um, celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary this summer. Some things you might not know uh, about my dad. Um, dad loved food. <laughs> I think we all probably knew that. However, when he was born, he was actually a very small baby. He was weighed in uh, somewhere around five pounds. And uh, the doctors told my grandparents, you know, he needs to put on some weight. And I'm proud to say he knocked that one <laughs> out of the park. Sometimes getting him to sleep at night was a challenge, and uh, my grandfather managed a movie theater in downtown Toronto, and when he would come home late from work, he would put my dad uh, in the car, probably no, nothing like a, a child seat back then, uh, and just drive him around the neighborhood, and he would fall asleep in the car, and then he would bring him home and bring him in the house, and that's how they would, would get him to sleep. Uh, they... My dad spent the first uh, about 13 years of his life. They lived in, uh, well, Toronto, an area that 
now called Midtown, um, uh, Mount Pleasant and Eglinton, I think the area. Um, and he can remember when the Toronto subway opened, the very first day it was free. So him and his brother, my Uncle Ron, would ride up and down the subway. <laughs> probably, probably hasn't run continuously since. Uh, they also love their summers at Orr Lake. Um, my grandparents rented a cottage on Orr Lake, and my grandmother would stay up with uh, my dad and my uncle Ron um, and, uh, uh, and Donna. And uh, my grandfather would go back and forth uh, to the city for work and see them on weekends. And when my, my grandpa would leave, they would leave them with a full tank of gas. Now I say a full tank of gas. It was a one horse motor. So it probably held in the neighborhood of four to six cups uh, of gasoline, but that's all they had. They had it last the week. So they would take the boat out, they would row it out to the lake so they could fish, and then when it came time to come home, either for lunch or supper, they would use the motor uh, to stretch that tank of gas. Uh, the summer that he was 14, uh, they moved uh, to the farm outside of uh, Elmvale, a town called Allenwood. They did not have a lot of even for those days, uh, modern equipment. Uh, so dad learned how to milk cows by hand. Uh, he actually knew all the verbal commands for a team of horses, whether it was out to work the field or to get the horses to maneuver uh, a load from the wagon up into the barn. Uh, as a result of this uh, farm life, he became uh, rather strong, very fit. One day, someone on a dare dared him that could he lift a transmission out of the back of a truck and carry it into a shed. Now he did it, but it, I think it was a decision he probably regretted uh, the rest of his life with uh, having chronic, some chronic back pain. Dad's first job was actually delivering blocks of ice for neighboring cottages in Woodland Beach. So these would be big blocks that you would put into the ice box before, my kids are looking at me like, why? Uh, <laughs> before refrigeration was around. Uh, and he did tell this one story. Uh, he would have been quite young, 14, 15, uh, where he was carrying the block uh, of ice in, and, and the guy met him out front, and he said, yeah, just go ahead and, and carry it into the cottage. Uh, he, he didn't know at the time he was being set up because uh, inside was the guy's wife who was getting dressed. <laughs> Dad went in. She shrieked. Dad was probably startled, came running out, and the guy was laughing because he thought it was quite funny. <laughs> uh, his next, uh, next job was at a factory uh, after high school, and he was working uh, a night shift along uh, with his brother, uh, my Uncle Ron. And uh, they came home one night after their shift, and uh, they were hungry. And they decided to go looking for something to eat. My grandmother was a great, great cook, great uh, baker, and she had baked, I don't know how many dozen, two, three, four dozen butter tarts, and they found them in the freezer. They were in one of the old movie reel uh, tins from my grandpa's days at the theater. So not only did they decide to help themselves to a butter tart or two, but they thought it'd be a good idea if they took the rest of the butter tarts out, put them in another container, they left one single butter tart in that tin for the, in the freezer, they went to bed, and they were woken up early in the morning, the sounds of my grandmother screaming, those boys ate all those butter tarts. Uh, I'm going to tell one more story. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I think it kind of typifies, at least for me, uh, what it was like having Bob Kitsemetry as a father. I'm sure some of you could, could appreciate this. <clears throat> December of... In 1985, uh, I turned 16, and like most of us back then, we could not wait to get our driver's license. So I went to school, Innisdale School here in Barrie, and rather than taking the school bus back home, I took the city bus downtown, transferred another city bus out to the east end of Barrie, which was the only ministry uh, office back then, to write my, my test. There were no cell phones that, back then. I didn't tell anybody I was going. And uh, I had to do that, do that same process. So by the time I got home, it was well past supper time, dark out. The 
air in the house was a little thick, we shall say. <laughs> Once Dad, everybody figured out what I had done, um, things kind of brightened up a little bit. And uh, I remember I was downstairs in the basement. We had a workshop down there. I was doing something at the workbench. My back was at the door. And Dad came in the room, and all he said was, hey, and I turned around, and then something kind of came flying at me, hit me in the chest, and I looked down, and it was a keychain that my Aunt Marlene had given me for my birthday. And on the keychain were a set of keys for both family vehicles. Oh, yeah. I had a grin like this. <laughs> and as my head sort of rose up and, and, and caught his eye, he had this very serious look on his face. And he was pointing his finger, and all he said was, you can lose them just as fast. <laughs> that was my dad. I will never forget him, and I'll always remember him with a smile. I gave dad his uh, first violin 30 years ago. A starving musician owed me rent money <clears throat> and an old student fiddle was all he had. <clears throat> the case was worth more than the fiddle, but dad taught himself to play his ninth instrument. Mom and I encouraged him to buy a better one <clears throat> until he finally did. He wasn't one to spend money on himself for things he didn't need. Dad gave all his grandchildren various instruments. He very recently played his fiddle with Jace and taught him to play the spoons. He loved hearing Jace's latest jokes, and he would proudly ask Google to tell them a new one. Many of you will remember Dad's favorite boat, the Green Grew. He took me with him to buy it one day when I was about nine. <clears throat> I convinced him to take it out fishing that day, and we ended up catching a big lake trout. <clears throat> I'll never forget it. He always had money for gas in the boats. Sometimes he would take us for three water skis in one day. <clears throat> we did a lot of projects together. <clears throat> Decks at the Warnica house. And then at the cottage, pine boards inside the cottage, the addition at the cottage, dock rebuilds, and many more. I'm as handy as I am today, thanks to Dad. <laughs> he drove me to hundreds of hockey games and practices. <clears throat> he would uh, drop us off for skiing and pick us up, always with a big smile a loaded pipe, and a couple of bad jokes. <laughs> he had inside jokes with all my friends and nicknames, and the more he liked you, the more he teased you. Everyone learned quickly not to call after 10 p.m. Because if you did, he would answer right away, and he would give you a hard time. Do you know what time it is? Is there an emergency? Anyway, Dad always encouraged us boys to try everything once, and uh, looking back, I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, my name is Owen, and I'm Bob's youngest son. Being the youngest and the last to speak, most things have already been said. I do remember special times with my father, like Saturday garage sailing, followed it by a trip to the 400 flea market for our treat of french fries and meat sticks. <clears throat> I spent many hours with him working on our family cottage and being taught valuable lessons, which at the time were annoying and cutting into my fun time with my friends. <coughs> However, as I got older and bought my first house, she was also the one that would come and help me with jobs. I went from being the gopher, go for this, go for that, to
to chief of construction and cottage opener and closer. Several friends have sent nice messages and reminders of the times we spent uh, with my dad at the cottage, learning how to water ski, fish, playing crokinole to see who, would, who was going to do the dishes that night, and it was never him. His musical ability enabled us to have sing-alongs beside cottage campfires uh, with the neighbors. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with my father in the car business at Barry Honda for several years. Those Saturday mornings spent garage selling became Saturday morning sales meetings. <clears throat> Excuse me. His sense of humor was well known to, amongst coworkers and friends alike. If it wasn't a smart aleck response to a simple question or just kind words when needed, he always knew what to say to get a smile. He'll always be loved and never forgot. Thank you for all those uh, tributes. I'm sure they brought up a lot of memories for life, all of us here as well. As we've been hearing, music was such a big part of Bob's life, and two of the people that he played with, Dave and Trish, are here, and they're going to uh, share some music in uh, Bob's honour. We met Bob uh, jamming. Bob would come and play the fiddle, and uh, he was uh, he was a challenge to play with because he'd get going on a tune, a jig in particular, and boy, he'd get faster and faster and faster. <laughs> But it was always fun to have Bob there. Lots of jokes, lots of lots of laughter. We want to honor Bob with this song written by Laura Smith. We felt it, and we thank Sharon for where she here she is <laughs> for uh, asking us to sing this. We're honored. <clears throat> Safe home, sweet life, no, no longer of this world. On wings, safe and sound, are you carried? No longer casting shadows, no longer counting days. You are love, and you are loved always safe home sweetheart no longer beating here your life is but a whisper to my sorrow but time does not confine you now my spirits I must raise you are love and you are loved always. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved always. Safe home, sweet light, no longer shining here. Though your joy is now a beacon for the weary, never more to shed a tear, never more to feel alone. You are love, and you are loved. Your home, you are love, and you are loved. Your home.
Thank you, Trish, and thank you, Dave. There are two more uh, tributes to be shared to Bob. I'd like to invite Jan, followed by Prisca, to come forward. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Jan, and I'm a longtime friend of Bob and Sharon's and their son, Kevin, Sean, and Owen. Together, um, we're here to celebrate Bob's vibrant and unforgettable life, a life well lived. I first met Bob and Sharon at Essa Road Church, where we had been attending for some time. At that time, we had a very active adult fellowship group going, and uh, Bob and Sharon decided to join us one evening. We clicked that night, and uh, from then on, we became friends, and that was about 57 years ago. A long time friendship. Bob was passionate about many things, and one of them was music, as we've just heard. My first introduction to his music was at the adult fellowship group. I remember sing songs around the piano and him jamming with the other people. He would casually begin playing and then people would just gravitate toward Bob, singing and laughing and the jokes would begin. Bob did love an audience. My children remember our many camping trips with the Cemetery family. At night after a day of swimming, water skiing and flipping burgers, we'd get a roaring fire going and the gang would roast marshmallows or maybe wieners, and Bob would bring out his harmonica sometime. Another time it might be his guitar or accordion. And these young campers and my kids together would uh, get going, um, singing crazy camp songs and laughing and roaring and uh, disturbing all the other campers. But we had great times together. Um, this bantering continued every every summer, uh, oh sorry, I missed a part. Um, another part with camping with the Cemetery family, when we camped with them, it always rained. And <laughs> Bob always blamed my family, and of course we blamed their family for the rain. And we had so much fun back and forth all the time, but it did really rain a lot when we camped. <laughs> this summer, or the summer passed when we uh, went to the cottage, and uh, it had been a gorgeous, week, sunshine, warmth, and we went to visit Bob and Sharon, and of course it was a cold, windy day, and Bob, as soon as we got there, he was quick to put the blame on you were the one bringing the bad weather again, so I guess, I guess Bob won on that one. As our children grew and became more adventuresome in our activities, one we really enjoyed together was cross-country skiing, and I remember, Owen, you were just a little wee tyke trying to move along. Uh, sometimes we'd ski at our home through the woods across the fields and now and again we'd find enough money to actually go to a place that was groomed and uh, and have a good ski and of course the end was always a pasta dinner or lasagna or some other uh, fellowship together with our food. We eventually braved taking up downhill skiing we packed lunches in the gear and set off today, the day for the slopes. And I remember one time skiing with Bob, coming down the slopes, and Bob was going a bit too fast, and he wasn't making the turns he should have been doing. And we get near the bottom, and I remember so well, he's yelling, open the chalet doors, I'm coming through. <laughs> <laughs> Bob didn't continue to ski for too long, but uh, Sharon capped at it till last winter, and I sure miss you this year, Sharon, on the slopes. Bob loved a good game of horseshoes, and John and Bob played horseshoes often. You could hear them at our houses, at the cottage, um, camping, wherever, but they were the clang of the horseshoes. Um, in 1979, um, after winning a qualifying match at, in Simcoe County, Bob and John went on to compete at the international plowing match. It was near Chatham, and they finished fifth place in that but their claim to fame and that was they did uh, beat the eventual winners, the winners of the whole championship. So they were pretty proud of themselves because they had uh, 
um, I, be, I think they were the McLaughlin brothers, actually. Um, John says to this day, but Bob was by far the better of their team. So uh, that's nice that uh, he gets that compliment. Another of Love's, Bob's love, of course, was dancing. Uh, and he was a fabulous dancer and just loved being on the dance floor. And I remember um, especially doing the polka with Bob, and I did not know how to do the polka, but uh, he grabbed me and just said, just keep on moving, just follow me, and we would spin and spin around the, the dance floor. But uh, there was so much fun uh, going to dances with uh, Bob and Sharon and just having a great time together. Uh, Bob, as you well know, had the gift of the gab. He could talk a room up and have you in stitches. Uh, that was, um, he would, he kind of knew who to gravitate to if they weren't having maybe just as great a time. And he was a great storyteller. Give him a glass or a, one or two glasses of wine and uh, he had the audience on, on the roll. Uh, as Bob's mobility became an issue, um, technology certainly became his assistant. He enjoyed FaceTiming, texting with family and friends, and it was his way of just dropping by for a visit. Um, quite often we would FaceTime together, and, and I know so many of you uh, had that experience as well. I don't know um, if you got this message, but if you sent out an email to Bob, and it was a group email, and you had other people's email, he was very quick to let you know uh, that wasn't uh, the way you should do it. And he sent me an email of the how to properly send an email. <laughs> and I don't know if anybody else got it, but I did. And uh, I didn't follow through on it. They still have uh, some learning to do on that. And I don't know, uh, we are so missing Bob's daily emails. Um, my husband has remarked, it's just not the same. We're not getting those jokes all the time. As well as being a fun-loving man, Bob had a, a tender side to him. He cared so much for, for his, his bride, as he often referred to Sharon, and his boys, and of course his grandchildren. I did say one email that Bob sent to me, and when I opened it, I thought it was the how to properly send an email, <laughs> but it wasn't. It was um, a poem written by Patricia Fleming called I Still Matter, and perhaps some of you have received this poem as well. This poem highlights the importance of embracing and honoring your inner self, your beauty, it is about aging gracefully, about accepting the changes and challenges that old age brings. And most of you know that you are, so many of us fit into this category, and, uh, and maybe Bob was feeling um, his age, I'm not sure. It also says that you are never too old to make a difference. No matter your age, no matter your looks, you can make a difference. And Bob, his life matters so much. Goodbye, my friend. My name is Priska. My siblings and I are second cousins to Bob and his siblings. We share a great-grandmother and a great-grandfather. More specifically, Bob's grandmother, Jenny, was our great-aunt Jane. And change of names is a recurring theme in our shared family. Because of my role as a family historian, Sharon asked me to speak about Bob's family history today. You would think that the fact Bob was descended from Charlemagne would be the focus. <laughs> but no, that branch of the family tree is less interesting than the Kitsemetry branch. Otherwise known as Ketskemity or Kedzkemity, Uncle Walter's last name was Ketskemity at birth. It changed to Kitsemetry sometime after his arrival in Canada from England at the age of 14. 
Between 1869 and 1948, over 100,000 disadvantaged children arrived in Canada from Great Britain as part of the British child emigration movement. Thousands more were sent to Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand. I use the adjective disadvantage because despite the perception they were all orphans, 98% were not. There were a number of British char charitable organizations that managed the process. One was known as Bernardo's. Founded by Irishman John Bernardo in 1867, Bernardo's is still in operation today. Uncle Walter, Bob's father, arrived in Quebec City on July 26, 1923, just over 100 years ago. He was sent by the Bernardo organization aboard the steamship Minute Adosa. Uncle Walter traveled with 148 other boys and 70 girls. The boys were bound for Toronto, the girls for Peterborough. All the children, some as young as eight years of age, were destined to become farm laborers or domestic servants. In England, a pretty picture was painted of a better life and opportunities to learn a trade. Stories were told about loving adoptive families and shining futures. The reality for many was far from idyllic. Uncle Walter's life was one of, of, of the success stories. Uncle Walter and his wife, Auntie Mary, taught their children the value of hard work, a value passed down through the generations. Another gift from the Kit Cemetery side of the family was Bob and Brian's love of performing music. We've heard about it many times today. Uncle Walter's grandfather, Stephen, was born in Budapest on the Pest side. While it was still part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Stephen emigrated to England where he joined the British Army as a musician. He toured the world as a soldier he was stationed in Jamaica and even Nova Scotia, all the while performing in a military band. At least one of his sons followed in his footsteps, listing his profession as musician on a census. Bob's grandmother, Uncle Walter's mother, died within weeks of Uncle Walter's birth. So I cannot say for sure that she was musical, but my guess is that she too had inherited the talent for music from her father. That Charlemagne line I mentioned at the beginning was one of Auntie Mary's line. My research suggests that those ancestors were also musical, although not professional. One might say that the musicianship of Bob and Brian was inevitable. If you are to enter the name Kit Cemetery in the search box of Ancestry.ca, only two official English documents will appear. Both are for Uncle Walter, and both misspell his last name. Mm -hmm. Kit Shemity and Kit Shemerity. Shem Kit Shemerity. The tree part, that's where we first see it, anyway, right there. If you change the search to Kit Shemity, 551 distinct documents appear. The odds are you are related to nearly all of them. Change the search to Canada and use the name Kit Cemetery. 51 documents appear, and they are all your family members. Kit Cemetery delivers 86 documents in the Canadian directory, most of which are tied to the family trees that I or other members of our families have started. Bob was proud of his Barnard roots. He was right to be. Thank you, Priska. I'd now like to invite Graydon and Larkin to come up and share the second Bible reading. First Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. Now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. Amen. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you for all the tributes that were shared today. And I know that uh, if every person here could come up and share a story or a memory, we couldn't exhaust all the ones that are out there. You know, I think it's so interesting that uh, you can know someone for years, and yet there's some things that you never knew about that person. For example, I had no idea about Bob's musical skills. Can you believe that? And I said to Cher, boy, he sure kept that hidden very well. Uh, at least he did when it came to church. Uh, I know he had such an appreciation for the music program at our church, but I never knew he could have taken part in it. But clearly it was a gift that was appreciated by so many of you and so many others. To me, the great gift that Bob brought to our church and brought to me personally was definitely the gift of his sense of humor. Every Sunday, how are you, Bob? And sure enough, he would respond, none of your business. <laughs> and then there'd be that smile and that twinkle in his eye and that ready laugh. And every Sunday, I would wait for it, and I would never be disappointed. I think one morning, if I'd ever said, how are you, Bob? And he'd said, I'm just fine, Phil. I would think that there was something actually wrong with him. <laughs> the other thing I always appreciated about Bob was his, his very faithful and quiet support of our church. You know, Bob didn't serve on committees or help to lead the service, but he was always there. Whether it was a Sunday morning, suppers or events, he and Sharon were always there. Most recently taking part in our trivia night just about a month ago. And wherever he went, as we heard, laughter would follow. He was quick with a story and a joke, maybe something a little controversial to see if people were listening. And uh, again, as we heard, he clearly loved people. He loved to socialize. He loved to make connections. He was a life lived in the company of others and made richer from the company of others. And the connections that he had created were clearly very, very dear to him. We're all going to remember Bob in a way that is special to each one of us. I'm going to remember him as the guy who could make me laugh and someone who truly cherished the people that he shared his life with. I will miss the part that he played in my life, just as you will miss the part that he played in your life. I just hope when he gets to the pearly gates, he doesn't ask, or I, I hope when he gets to the pearly gates, St. Peter doesn't ask, how are you, Bob? Because he may be in for a surprise. <laughs> I'm certainly not going to preach a sermon today because that's not what we're here to do. We're here to honor Bob. But I know that church and faith were a very important part of both Bob and Sharon's life. As Sharon told me, Bob believed the most important part of faith was simply trying to be a good person, and that he was. But for those of us who follow the Christian faith, this, of course, is the most important week of the year. We call the week before Easter Holy Week, the week that connects the story of Palm Sunday with Easter Sunday. And that, of course, includes Good Friday, the day we commemorate or mark the death of Jesus. That makes this a week about death, but also a week about life. A week of sadness, but also a week of rejoicing. And at some level, those are themes that we all can relate to today. 
Today is about honoring death, but it's also about celebrating life. It's a day for tremendous grief, the Good Friday kind of grief. But it's also a day about the joy that we feel when we think about the amazing life that we shared with Bob. The truth of it is none of us live our lives in isolation, but every day, in ways big or in ways small, we are having an impact on our world. Every day we are send out ripples from our living. Those ripples shift and cross the waters of life with a cause and effect that can change so much without us even knowing it. And when the waters calm again, we can realize just what effect those ripples had. Bob's earthly life may have come to an end, but the impact of that life never will. Not so long as those who know him, all of us here today and all of you watching, not so long as all of us continue to share those stories of his life, relive the memories, and most importantly, live the best parts of his life forward. One of the lessons that Bob taught me was never take myself too seriously. And I'm going to cherish that lesson and I'm going to live it forward. And you will do the same. Take the best parts of his life and live them forward. Bob brought joy to other people, whether at church, whether in his social circles at Tollendale, sharing music, or through all his connections in Barrie, and most especially in his family. The great way we can honor him and redeem some of the sadness of the grief that we feel is to bring that spirit of joy and humor right into our own lives. It's a way that we move from the sadness of Good Friday to the hope of Easter Sunday. And that is what Easter is. It's a message of hope. It's a message of life. It's a message of spring. It's the ball breaking through the ground. It's the blossom opening on the tree. It's the birds singing to welcome the dawn. It's the promise of life. It doesn't explain away or ignore the sadness of Good Friday, the sadness of death and loss, but it blows a freshening breeze into it and stirs it up with the promise that life and not death always has the last word. Today we acknowledge the grief that comes with having to say goodbye to our friend Bob. We will all miss him very much. But today we also acknowledge all the good that Bob will live on, about Bob that will live on and be shared. And therefore, we also give thanks. We give thanks for his sense of humor. We give thanks for the depth of his love, for Sharon, for his family, for his friends. We give thanks for his commitment to the things that brought him happiness and brought that happiness to others. We give thanks for the gifts and the skills that he so readily shared with other people. And we give thanks for his lively and his enthusiastic spirit. And part of giving thanks for Bob's life is now committing ourselves to taking care of one another as we walk the journey of grief that is ahead. That we embody for each other the love, support, kindness, and humor that Bob embodied for each of us. May the difficult road that is ahead be lightened by all the good memories we have, be lightened by our faith, and be lightened by the love that we freely give and offer to each other. You know, no doubt in the weeks ahead, many people will ask us how we are. Let's all say at least once in Bob's honor, <laughs> none of your business. <laughs> Amen. I'd like to uh, share a prayer, and at the end of the prayer, I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer, and if you know it and you'd like to say it with me, please feel welcome to do so. God, in whom we find our hope and our faith, we share in this silent moment of prayer. We give you thanks for the gift of Bob's life. We thank you for all that he did and all that he accomplished in that life. We thank you for the special gifts that he had, for the love he shared with others. We thank you for all the ways that he will live on, inspiring the life journey of all who knew him. We now commend him to your care 
as in life you commanded him to ours. May he find eternal peace. May he know everlasting love. May you bless and keep all of Bob's family here today and all of those family and friends who, although not here, are certainly here in spirit. May they know the comfort and warmth of family and community. May the certainty of time bring healing and renewed hope. May you bless and keep us as we leave here today. And may we continue to live for the legacy that Bob leaves behind as we continue to live our lives to their fullest and nurture within ourselves the gift of peace and hope. Hear us now as together we share the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing song today is called Don't Take the Good Times for Granted. I'm going to invite you just to remain seated for it. We're going to listen to it uh, over the speakers. The words are printed in the bulletin. So please, if you'd like to, uh, to sing along with, uh, with, the, uh, with the professionals, please feel welcome to do so. friend last evening and I mentioned concerns that I had about things that unfurled in the ways of the world and how sometimes it makes me feel sad I said life can be so complicated and I'm scared I might lose my way when a friendly hand pressed on my shoulder He smiled and I heard him say Son, don't take the good times for granted For things keep on changing each day Make time to be with the ones that you love Let nothing stand in your way we don't know what waits round the corner We never know what lies ahead So just for a moment Forget all your troubles And count all your blessings instead of the future and of all of the things I might do Son, follow your heart cause if you never dream your dreams they can never come true Should you choose a road that's less traveled Just know I'll be there to the end you're not just a shoulder to lean on I thank you for being my friend Don't take the good times for granted For things keep on changing each day Make time to be with the ones that you love Let nothing stand in your way we don't know what waits round the corner We never know what lies ahead So just for a moment Forget all your troubles And count all your blessings instead So don't take the good times for granted For things keep 
on changing each day. Make time to be with the ones that you love. Let nothing stand in your way. We don't know what waits round the corner. We never know what lies ahead. So if just for a moment, forget all your troubles and count all your blessings instead. So if just for a moment, forget all your troubles and count all your blessings instead. Just a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand for the benediction, and then I'm also going to invite you to remain standing. At, uh, at our church at Northwest, we end all of our services with the song, Go Now in Peace. So we're going to end this service with the singing of that song. I think there's enough Northwest people scattered through here that will certainly help us with the singing. I invite you now to please stand. And now in a spirit of love, we close this service of remembrance of the life of Bob. May we go from here with a spirit of hope as we reflect on what Bob meant to us. May we go from here with a spirit of gratitude as we give thanks for his life. May we go from here with a spirit of love as we commit to caring for one another. May we go from here in a spirit of peace, knowing that God goes with us now and forevermore. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is now coming to the completion of the service here inside the chapel. Again, on behalf of the family, thank you all for joining and showing your support. Just a friendly reminder that there's a reception downstairs in the lower lounge, which we'll be recessing to shortly. And just one other note I'd like to mention, inside the lobby of the funeral home, right underneath the TV and right by the staircase, we have a memory jar set up. And that's really for the intent anyone here has a nice memory or a thought or a phrase. You can write that down on a piece of paper place it inside the jar, and that's something that the family can reflect on afterwards. So it's a nice gesture. If you have a few moments to please do so. I'll ask that you please remain standing. <laughs> 